Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 237. I'm recording in January of 2020. We have a new year, a new decade, and there's always something new to talk about in the world of genealogy. Around here at Genealogy Gems, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Genealogy Gems podcast app. We kind of blazed a new trail back in 2010 when we launched the app. Apps were still relatively new back then, and I loved the idea of having a way to deliver exclusive bonus content to you, as well as the podcast audio, the show notes, and best of all, a really easy way for you to contact me and the show. The app is more popular than ever. And as far as I know, we are still the only genealogy podcast app that's available. So if you haven't already downloaded it, just search for Genealogy Gems in Google Play or Apple's App Store. Now, in this episode, I have two interviews for you that are on very different subjects. First up, we're going to follow up on last month's episode where we focused specifically on the New York Public Library Photographer's Identities Catalog. I hope you liked that. And I hope that you took advantage of uh, using that maybe to help you identify some of your old photographs. Well, in this episode, we're going to talk to the genealogy reference librarian at the New York Public Library, Andy McCarthy. And as you'll soon hear, there are a massive amount of resources available for all genealogists everywhere. Then we're going to switch gears to Scandinavian genealogy with David Frixell. He is the author of the new book, The Family Tree Scandinavian Genealogy Guide, How to Trace Your Ancestors in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. So what do you say? Let's get going. And first stop will be the New York Public Library. In this episode, we're going to explore the New York Public Library, and specifically the Milstein Division of United States History, Local History, and Genealogy. Now, it's one of the largest public genealogical collections in the country, and here to tell us more about it is the reference librarian, Andy McCarthy. Hi, Andy. Welcome to the show. Hi, hi. Thanks for having me. Obviously, your library would have an emphasis on New York resources, but I know that you have stuff available for genealogists across the country and really around the world. So I'd love to have you give us kind of a brief overview of the genealogical resources that are available, particularly those that might be online, since, of course, many of our listeners are spread out across the country. Uh, sure. So we, we do have a certain focus on New York City in, in the sense that when people have questions about the history of New York City, they get directed towards our division. But that's what I feel like is one of the strengths of the Milstein Division is that our reference purview is very wide-angled. It's not just genealogy. It's not just family history. It's local history and U.S. history. All right, so we get a lot of different kinds of questions, and so we can throw a lot of things at um, our patrons uh, or recommendations, right? And I, I just want to stress, too, that myself and my colleagues, Phil Sutton and Sue Creedy, we are genealogy librarians, right? We're not genealogists. Um, and the first thing I wanted to highlight as far as online resources, which is the, the, you know, the, the, the focus of your question that the library makes available, um, is our email reference, right? We do a lot of remote um, reference requests, people from all over the world, and it's not just questions about New York City or New York State, and it's not just questions about, you know, genealogy or, or family history, but the bulk of them are. And I would say that if, even if you can't visit the library, you can still take advantage of the librarianship of emailing us and uh, asking questions. That makes us better librarians, um, is helping patrons this way. And it, it's not the most, you know, 
you don't really think of the librarian as a resource, but that is a lot of the, the, this, this sense of librarianship, uh, sort of picking our brains, is a, uh, a lot of you know, what we do. So that would, I would say first, reach out. Our email is history at nypl.org. Um, and it's on our website, too. If you just Googled Milstein Division NYPL, uh, you would you know, get to our homepage. Anyhow, the other thing I would stress... You know, because we don't, we subscribe to databases. It's not like we digitize things and put them online in, in a database format, although I am going to talk about it. I'll mention a couple things that we, we do because we do have a digital collections. I would stress using the library's catalog, right? We have bazillions and bazillions and bazillions of books, periodicals, newspapers, etc. And if someone just wanted to kind of get a sense of what was available. You know, is there a local history on uh, Montgomery County in Ohio at, for in, you know, the 1890s? Well, you could uh, sort of fish around our catalog, use the subject headings, and g- get a sense of what we have, and then that'll give you a larger sense of what is available because our uh, collections are very extensive. You know, g- uh, they've been collecting genealogy materials and local history materials at NYPL since the library started back in the day. So using the catalog, not just to see, you know, oh, what can I access at the library, but kind of using it as, um, as kind of a database of what is available. And, uh, and you really want to take advantage of those the subject headings that, um, that are used to group similar material together in the catalog record. Email reference and remote reference and, 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 and the catalog, I really want to stress here. Uh, as far as actual, you know, stuff, there are two digitized materials I'll, I'd point out. One is our city directory collection. So recently, uh, the libraries made available New York City city directories um, up to 1933 for the five boroughs. Manhattan is coming. That, that, the 1933 is, are the newest ones that went up there. Manhattan is, is going to be the last one to, to show up. Um, I mean, it's only, you know, like 3,000 pages or something. But city directories, anyone who's doing genealogy, uh, I'm sure you've used a city directory no matter what the locale is, if it's a county, big city, small town, etc. And for the longest time, these were only available pretty much on microfilm. Um, and there was a project that uh, the division got involved in to digitize these things. And it's they're freely available online. They're not keyword searchable. You still have to go page by page, but um, you know to scroll through. And there's also the 1940 telephone directory is up there as well. Uh, so and those are freely available online. Like I said, at the digital collections, digitalcollections.nypl.org. Another resource is our, uh, our digitized fire insurance atlases. Now, the MAP division, there's the Milstein division, you know, U.S. History, Local History, Genealogy, and then there's the MAP division. We're sort of sibling uh, divisions under the same supervisor. And MAPs and Local History and Genealogy certainly play off one another. MAPs are usually are going to, you know, typically are going to play a key role in your, in your family history or local history research. So the MAP division has digitized select fire insurance atlases for each of the five boroughs. They're up on our website. Um, they're arranged chronologically. And they're also part of this, um, I mean, what would you call it, this, this program called the Map Warper. And the Map Warper, without going too, into too much detail about it, basically um, overlays historic maps of New York City over the current map of New York City. And it's this, it's, it's this uh, crowdsourcing project where people can go in, create an account, and then take the digitized maps and, and over, overlay them the, the current map. And then there's this transparency bar where you can kind of drag it back and forth to kind of compare you know, what the block looked like in 1890 compared to today. So uh, those are the four that I'll highlight. Well, I think 
Those are great examples of the fact that a library is so much more than what's online, and yet you have the tools on your website to help your patrons really discover all that's available also offline. Because as you said, emailing you is really the link, isn't it, to being able to uh, get access, maybe make a request. Uh, If somebody found something and you did a quick look up or told them, yes, we have those things, what kinds of resources would be available to them to maybe request um, a more in-depth look up or maybe a photocopy? It, it, I mean, it, I guess it kind of depends. I mean, our, our collections, the collections in the Milstein Division are, are secondary sources for the most part. I mean, we're not an archive. And, and sure, primary sources are, um, are uh, used in, in genealogy research, but, you know, those are, would be like through the databases, Ancestry, Family Search, whatever. So it's mostly secondary sources. I, I don't know, about a half a million books, pamphlets, periodicals, newspapers. I mean, now... Because we're reference librarians, you know, technically, we're not here to do the research for patrons. We're here to put them in touch with the resources so they can do it themselves. This is mm-hmm. not to say, like, oh, you know, you know don't bother us. But, um, but there are photocopying services. There's research services that the library makes available. Uh, it, it depends on how, how involved the question is and how much is really demanded as far as the researcher having to come in or something that the librarian can say, oh, try this, try this, try this, or then we'll say, you know, maybe you should, you, you might want to go through a research services division. So it, it's kind of a case-by-case basis. It depends on the questions. But, um, but like I said, these questions are what make us uh, uh, better librarians and, and um, getting more involved in all these different types of resources and, and, and the subjects involved. And I imagine that people will ask you, uh, what do I need to do to prepare to actually visit in person? Um, do you have any suggestions to really make sure that people get the most out of their visit? Yes, and that is number one, is to reach out to us beforehand. Um, just to make sure that you're prepared, just to make sure that you know what to expect, right? and that we can kind of uh, you know, get a sense of what you're looking for, what's going to be relevant, what might not be relevant. You say, oh, you know, we don't have this. You can, you know, um, you know, maybe if you're, if you're researching a building. Now, sure, we uh, in New York City, we have resources here, but you, there's other repositories or, uh, you know, other places that you want to go, the building, building department, Department of Finance, whatever. So just, you know, to kind of get a sense of uh, what the patron is intending to do and then what's best going to serve them so that they know what to expect from the library. So I would say definitely reach out beforehand. Um, And I would also uh, urge anyone planning on visiting of taking a look at the research that you've done prior, uh, even if you're just getting started, even if you're getting started, just take whatever that you have, kind of put it in order, you know, organize it a little bit and then focus on one or two specific questions uh, or, spe- you know, on specific pieces of information that you want to pursue and start there because, you know, people come in, they say, oh, you know, I'm doing genealogy, whatever you got on my family, you know, that, that makes it very difficult. That's an impossible question to, to, to answer. Um, so usually we'll just make something up uh, so that they're happy. <laughs> but um, so I would say form a specific question you know, a a couple of specific pieces of information, kind of narrow it down, and they say, oh, okay, try this, try this, try this, et cetera. And our website, each division in the building uh, uh, has their own homepage. And the Milstein Division's homepage has access procedures, contact information. Uh, We do a lot of public classes. So if somebody's visiting uh, around the time that uh, one of our public classes is going on. You might want to check that out. We do them on a bunch of different subjects, uh, subjects that we get a lot of questions about. Also on the homepage are our research guides, and this was another resource I wanted to point out, is that the librarians here will author these research guides on different, again, different subjects that we get a lot of questions about. There's a research guide on city directories, uh, uh, how to research a building, um, uh, how to research a family business. Of course, there is there is a research guide on how to research New Jersey history on there, which I don't know how that got on on, on there. <laughs> but um, I don't know what uh, there, there was. We got hacked. I think yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, 
I, of course, I did that one, and I'm from New Jersey. So, <laughs> uh, so, so check out the website and check out the research guides because even if, um, you know, even if you've been doing this for years. Uh, and you say, oh, you know, I, I've exhausted this or I've exhausted that. You never know what you might pick up, might, what might, you know, sort of jump out at you. So there's always new things to learn, right? Well, the research guys sound like a great tool, and that's a wonderful thing to tap into online. And, and you make a really good point that uh, genealogy always comes back to really good research questions. And I think reference librarians are the first probably, you know, kind of front line people who – kind of get bombarded with questions and and you really see the good, the bad, the ugly in terms of, you know, whether people have really thought it through and broken it down. They're a big question into bite-sized questions that can actually get answered. And that's how you find the right resources. Right, right. Genealogy and genealogy research are the it's the same thing. There, there's no, there's no research method. There's no genealogy without the research methods. Right. Uh, and and sometimes I think sometimes people have um, uh, they don't initially think about it that way. Right. And and there's multiple steps involved. And you don't want to drive yourself crazy. You start one thing at a time, step yeah. step by step. And to get a sense that visiting the library, or reaching out to the library. Even if it's not the actual stuff, even if it's not the actual collections that you're using, you can still use the librarianship, right? That what we have uh, to offer here, mm-hmm. uh, my colleagues and I. So, um, again, history at nypl.org is the contact info. You Google it, you'll find it. So Absolutely. I want to ask you about some of your, if you have any favorite collections yourself, but First, I want to just check with you. You've mentioned some great research strategies just online to get prepared, to find the the guides, to check out maybe a couple of those specialized databases that you have. Any other search tips, any other user tips for using the website? Well, I would say when you're browsing the catalog, because, you know, this is the collections of the New York Public Library System, which is gargantuan. Yeah. The way to narrow things down is on each of the catalog records, there are subject headings. And the subject headings, you know, this is kind of like, you know, li- li- librarian 101. Uh, the subject headings are used to group similar material together. And often, when you're getting into lo- local history uh, material in particular, it's going to be arranged by the locale. And in genealogy research, you realize, you know, there's always a, a where and a when. And mm-hmm. usually in the, in the subject headings are arranged by locale, and then there's subheadings, you know, to the cert, uh, maybe a certain county and then, and then a certain type of resource. And just kind of fishing around for the subject headings in the catalog is a little, it's a little way to kind of to, to, to narrow things down, right, to just kind of zero in on the collections that the library has. So that's a little search tip that I would recommend. Excellent. Well, so... You're there. You said you're not technically a genealogist yourself, but certainly it sounds like you've got some roots in the area. Do you have any favorite collections, even if they are um, strictly available inside the library itself? Uh, I don't know. I was thinking about that. I mean, the the, the favorite collection ends up being uh, you know the one that 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 is the, the most relevant to you know what you're looking for exactly. at, at the moment. But um, I mean, I guess for the online material. The, the the city directories are super super useful, and and as far as go to, right, um, and they also act as an alternative for for other resources as well. So I don't know. I'm kind of flopping the the the, the favorite resource question, but no, no problem. You know, I know one of my favorites is that Sanborn fire insurance map collection that you were talking about. Um, it's just incredible the detail that's available in those maps. And you were talking about the map overlays, which really intrigued me because I do so much work with uh, using Google Earth in conjunction with with genealogy. And there again, you're talking about these map overlays. And as you said it yourself, it's all about time frame and location. These two things have Mm -hmm. to merge together to get the context to make sure we're in the right collections overall. But I agree with you. The best collection is the one with your ancestors in it. So that, yeah. I mean, I guess one thing I, I also will highlight is this, on the digital collections, they have digitized the Milstein's 
collection of photographic views of New York City. Basically, oh, yeah. they're you know street street views of um, of of the five boroughs. The bulk, of course, is is going to be Manhattan, mm-hmm. um, and they're they're generally between. 1910s through, I don't know, 1950s or so, and they're arranged by the cross streets. So if you just type in an address, likely something's not going to come up if you're looking for a building on a certain, you know, in a, in a certain street. But if you type in the cross streets, um, that's how these this collection, these images were uh, arranged and described, and they're they're highly zoomable. I mean, you can they're very very finely, you know, in in high res most of them. And then there's Verso data that, you know, describes the, you know, what's in the photograph. But between the photos and the maps and the city directories, well, you have three, you know, great resources that you can use to cross-reference right there in our digital collections. And of course, you know, another key research method in genealogy is cross-referencing, right? Mm -hmm. Triple checking. So the photos, the maps, the city directories, and you have a lot to work with right there. You know, oh, yeah. and one I, of the reasons why those are up there is because they are so highly used. Absolutely. And I think of how many, particularly Americans, have had ancestors who maybe didn't settle in New York City, but uh, they maybe got off at Ellis Island, and they traveled yes. the streets and got on the trains, and they made their way west. And so everybody often has some type of connection there with New York City. That is, that's one of the top questions that we get which is somebody saying that, you know, my, I have a relative who emigrated through the port of New York. And um, sure, there were many, you know, by the end of the 19th century, there were, there were plenty of other ports in the United States, but most people up to at least the 40s were coming through the port of New York City, whether they stayed here or not. All right. And, uh, and that, yeah, that's, that's one of the top questions that we get. Um, and, uh, you know, there's plenty of, plenty of options you know, when someone's pursuing that, but exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Well, anything else I haven't even thought to ask you of that you would love to tell our audience? I, I don't know. I think, um, I think I covered it. I would say reach out. Mm-hmm. All right. Reach out. Um, it's a very busy reference desk and, um, you know, librarians, you can really only be on there for about an hour and a half before you have to go sit in the lotus position, you know, for, <laughs> for, for a half hour and just kind of decompress. But um, if you plan on visiting, definitely reach out beforehand uh, just, just to make sure that you're prepared, that you know what to expect, um, that you can, get, you can put in a request for materials beforehand. Uh, and, um, yeah. And, and we answer questions not just on New York City and not just on genealogy. Like I said, it's the U.S. History, Local History, Genealogy Division. So we get, we get all kinds of uh, stuff that falls into that, like I said, that, that reference purview that keeps our research acumen, keeps it going, keeps it invigorated. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, uh, so uh, we'll hope to hear from uh, your listeners. Well, I appreciate the tour of the New York City Public Library and uh, the Milstein Division. And, of course, uh, I understand a little bird told me that uh, you've been a tour guide for a long time. You did eight years as a New York City double-decker bus tour guide. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. And uh, that that was, well, I used to say that that's the best job that I'll, I'll ever have. Until I got this one, yeah. of course. But it definitely prepared me for you know to work as a public reference librarian because I said it's a really busy, really busy desk. So I was um, and dealing with the public every day, and yeah, that you can't really make a career out of that. Uh, you know, being a, a double decker bus tour guide, um, <laughs> and I feel like the, the things have things have changed in that industry too. Yeah. But. Uh, it was a blast while while it lasted, and I learned a lot. You know, I learned a lot about New York City. I learned a lot about people, and I never ended up uh, hitting my head on one of those seven hundred pound traffic lights that uh, overhang yes. the cross uh, sections. Exactly. So. Well, I imagine you learn how to to deal with a lot of different people and answer a lot of questions, which is exactly right. what you do today. <laughs> right now, see the 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 irony is that um, with the you know. As a tour guide, you're almost encouraged to make things up. Right? You don't, you're not letting the truth get in the way of the story. Whereas right, a librarian, right. your priorities are the exact opposite. Right? You want to kind of sift through all the riffraff and get uh, down to the uh, 
Well, yeah. What's the, what, the truth of it all. Not the, well, the truth is that I didn't really want to use that word, <laughs> but uh, just to, how about accuracy? There you, you know, go. Accuracy. Yes. That is a better way to describe it. Sure. Love it. Well, Andy McCarthy, thank you so much for uh, taking us on a tour. And I have got to get over there myself in person someday. I hope I'll get a chance to meet you then. Yes, likewise. I hope to see you. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our sponsor for this episode is My Heritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, My Heritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And My Heritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic Web Hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Well, if you've got Scandinavian ancestors, then there is a brand new book that you're going to want to know about. It's called The Family Tree Scandinavian Genealogy Guide, How to Trace Your Ancestors in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And I am so pleased to have the author with me today, David Frixell, the founding editor of Family Tree Magazine. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems podcast, David. Thanks. It's great to be here. We talk so often on the Family Tree Magazine podcast that I host, and, and and you write so many great articles for the magazine. Congratulations on the new book. This is exciting. Well, thanks. It's been, uh, you know, it was a, a long time going, and the, the magazine had done a whole series of these uh, guides, German and Irish and so forth. So this really followed along, um, you know, in the same uh, vein. And I, I like to think I was perfect for it because I'm half Swedish, my wife is half Norwegian, and my favorite cousin, besides being half Swedish, is half Danish. So I had <laughs> personal examples, um, and my cousin got you know free genealogy work as I researched you know her uh, Danish family. Um, so I had a you know personal stake in it, and had done a fair amount of work exploring all of those ancestries, which are are pretty interesting. And plus, I went to a uh, Norwegian college, and in South Dakota, so kind of got a little oh, bit of wow. all that. You know, grew up with that heritage, and growing up in the Midwest, you know, it's it's oofta all over the place. So absolutely, well, it's funny because, as far as I know, I don't have Scandinavian heritage, but certainly my husband's family is Swedish, and uh, my daughter Lacey and I got a chance to go to Norway and Sweden for the first time ever when I spoke at the My Heritage Live conference, their first conference in 2018, and. 
I loved both countries. She kept saying, I feel right at home. I just feel like these are my people. <laughs> you, you do get that feeling, you know, uh, exactly. Uh, my, uh, my sister-in-law said when she visited the, the island of Venn, where some of their family comes from, she says, as you just said, everybody looks like us. Yeah, you know, so you yeah. do get that feeling. Exactly. Well, okay, so let's dig into this a little bit. And, and I can ask a lot of naive beginner questions because um, I'm fairly new to this, although I've done some Swedish research for my husband's family. Um, okay, so we know that Denmark, Sweden, and Norway are geographically close in proximity. These are the Scandinavian countries. And Finland is connected to both Sweden and Norway. But to understand the ties between the Scandinavian countries and why countries like Finland and Iceland aren't part of Scandinavia, we kind of have to understand the culture and the language, right? Right. And you often hear the reference to Nordic countries, which yes. typically includes um, Finland and sometimes uh, the Baltic states also. Technically, um, and I didn't even really know this until I started the, uh, the book, um, Scandinavia really refers to those three countries because they have very similar languages. Mm-hmm. Finnish, if you know anything about it, is completely different and is sort of vaguely related to Central European languages. Um, Iceland is sort of a different case. It really doesn't get covered in the book much because um, there just aren't that many people of Icelandic heritage here, but it, it was pretty much settled by people from, you know, Scandinavia. But over the years, and we go into this a fair amount in the book because it's useful to understand the history, over the years the borders of Sweden, Denmark, and Norway went back and forth. They owned each other. At one point in the Kalmar Union they were actually were all united, um, and, of course, then the records often reflect, you know, who was in charge, you know, at that particular point. I talk about the uh, Norwegian college I went to, which they still um, celebrate Sitten um, de Mai, the uh, 16th of uh, May, which is the Norwegian Constitution Day. And uh, we always used to, in our Swedish family, you know, joke that we were going to wear black armbands because that was the start of the uh, independence of Norway from Sweden. Um, mm-hmm. But it, so there's sort of rivalries, you know, through history, right. um, but also enormous amount of shared history, and the languages are, you know, very, very similar. And the types of records, happily, are generally pretty similar, with a few exceptions. Well, and it, it's that history, which you do devote a portion of the book to, that's critical because it connects to the records. You said it yourself, that you kind of don't know which records are available or where to go to find them unless you do understand how the borders particularly have changed over the time and and how the different uh, jurisdictions are laid out. So that's really key. It's it's easy to look at that and go, well, I just want to get to the record part of the book, but it's so important, isn't it? Right. Well, and the the history then also relates to the history of immigration. Right. Um, And each of the countries has a slightly different story as to when their immigration got going, how many of them came to America, when they came to America. So if you just know you're Danish, your story is not necessarily exactly going to be the same as someone whose family came from Sweden, for example. They, they've come at different times or for different reasons. Okay, well, let's do that. Let's get our bearings on the time frames that we're talking about. So give us a kind of a general overview. What's the timeline of Scandinavian immigration and the well, peoples from the different countries? There were a few um, sort of oddball ones. At about the same time as New Amsterdam, for example, back in the the 1600s, there actually was a New Sweden in the sort of New Jersey, Delaware kind of area. So they were, you know, the first Swedes in America. And in fact, the first president under the Continental Congress um, was a a Swede. But the whole New Sweden thing just didn't really pan out. (laughs) Um, And so the story really doesn't begin until about the 1820s. Um, when the impulse was most often, as it is so often in American history, um, religious persecution. So Quakers and other people who were not part of the state Lutheran church. Just remember, um, a very important thing to keep in mind is all three of these countries had originally a Catholic church and then a state Lutheran church. And even though they're not particularly religious countries today, the Lutheran Church was the official church in each country and was in charge of all the record-keeping of all kinds. There's an upside to this, as we'll see. But for those people who were not into that, that began some migration. Then 
this U.S. Civil War kind of put an end, to, temporary end to that. But after the war, all three countries began to contribute immigrants, mostly for economic reasons then. There were famines, you know, various things went wrong. Plus, on the bright side, smallpox vaccination had led to an explosion of population. And these countries, if you know anything about their geography, there was nowhere to go. I mean, they, they are like mostly rocky or forested places, and so it's not like you could just set off and, you know, claim some new land. The land had all pretty much been claimed. And a lot of people lived in, you know, extreme poverty. My ancestors in Sweden, we always tell the story that one year my great-grandfather uh, lost his winter coat, and so he had to spend all winter inside because they couldn't afford to buy him a new coat. Wow. And before they decided to immigrate to America, the family's one cow froze to death. So, I mean, they didn't have much. You know? oh, gosh. Um, so they came over seeking economic opportunity, and as I said many of them landed in various parts of the Midwest. My wife's family literally broke the sod when they came from Norway in part of South Dakota for the first time. So all those states, and then to some extent Washington um, and the Pacific Northwest, had this huge influx of Norwegian and yes. Swedes, and to a lesser extent, Danes. And they were seeking you know, economic opportunity. So that first wave, which is kind of the 1825 to 1860 wave, that's really centered around religious persecution and maybe and, not fitting into the, the state's church, if you will. And, and opportunity to some extent, but, yeah. it, but after the Civil War, it really kicked off. Um, so that's that second then, wave. That's 1865 to 1880, right? Right. And then industrialization really helped spur the, a third wave which ended in 1924 when the U.S. clamped down on uh, immigration, although it had pretty much died down anyway then. But industrialization pushed people from the farms to from what were really very rural countries to the cities, and there wasn't necessarily room for them in the cities. And so they, uh, you know, they decided they would try North America. And meanwhile, they were getting all kinds of propaganda from people often sponsored by the ship lines, in the states who had already come over who is you know land of milk and honey you know food has fallen from the sky right uh the reality was was much much harsher but, particularly uh, in south dakota and minnesota oh, geez, and north yeah. dakota. oh my gosh i just <laughs> did some were, farming up in north dakota and that's still tough terrain my swedes landed in moline illinois and they were following in the footsteps of uh those who'd gone before and the very first Swedes, I mentioned in the book, to uh, get to Moline, walked there from Chicago, um, which is a couple hundred miles, with their kids, and leaving some of their younger kids behind because they, of course, couldn't walk that far, and they didn't reunite for years. So it was not an easy road that they, uh, you know, that these people chose. Absolutely. So many people, they know that they're Swedish or they're Norwegian. I'm curious, before we kind of get into the record sides of things, let's talk about DNA, because people are seeing Scandinavia pop up in their DNA results. What do you think the value is, and what should people keep in mind as they're testing and they're seeing these Scandinavian results? Well, in particular, Scandinavian results are a little tricky with DNA, partly because there is all that intermingling. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to lose track. Uh, in fact, the uh, 23andMe site uses Scandinavian as an example um, where it's the trade-off between um, precision, as they call it, and recall. And with Scandinavian, if you have pretty high precision, that is, if we say you're Scandinavian and you were sure of it, they actually have very low recall. They're missing a lot of um, people. Or you could go the reverse, but it's one of the cases where there's the most divergence. So you're most likely to just get, oh, you have X percent Swedish or Danish or Norwegian, and even there, you know, they, they may be, maybe your Danes were part of Germany for a while. There's a lot of iffy ones. So I think the most useful thing with DNA for Scandinavians is in finding other relatives. Because let's say you don't know where the family came from. That's the key, you know, as with so many genealogy things. You, you want to know where back in Sweden or nowhere, Denmark, your branch came from specifically as possible well, if you don't know maybe this third cousin that you discovered through dna testing knows known all the answer all along um or that 
second cousin has the family Bible, that, like in my case. You know? Yes. Um, so it's making that connection, I think, is probably the most useful once you get to the beyond the very broad brush of, oh, great, I'm half Danish. Right. As, as it's the case with, I think, much of DNA, that's really the value. It's trying to connect with other people and see how those trees compare and what kind of records people have. So let's say that we know who our ancestor is that immigrated. We figured out, okay, that's my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather. What else do we need to know? Because ultimately, DNA is not going to give us all the answers. We want to get into the records. Um, But before we jump the pond, are there certain things that we really need to have in our back pocket before we get over there and start looking through records? Well, the real key is, you know, it's good to know when and where specifically they came from, because the census or whatever is just going to tell you, you know, Sweden. And this is a rare case where you may be able to jump the pond even before you find them in U.S. passenger records because most of these countries had basically immigration departure records that are quite good and were taken for various reasons. But the the main one, in the case of Denmark, for example, the police started immigration records in Copenhagen because as a part to deter fraud, their people who were sailing were being taken advantage of, basically, by scam artists. And so the result is you have this large, searchable database of people who left from Denmark. The churches also, they kept very close tabs, and if you, depending on the country, the level of detail, but basically, if you moved from parish to parish, they recorded it. Mm-hmm. If you left for North America, they recorded it. So you, if you know where to look, you may be able to find um, those records, um, or, or passenger records, basically, from the other side of the pond that will let you sort of skip ahead and get to those essential questions of, well, where specifically did they live? Oh, that's great. Because, you know, some churches, depending on what part of the world, they're only recording church activities. But you're really talking about church records that <laughs> capture things like and they moved. <laughs> that's amazing. They, they recorded everything, vaccinations. Wow. You know, there's a whole set of vaccination records. I mean, yeah, the, the church records, because you had these state churches, mm-hmm. they were, uh, until relatively recently, responsible for everything. And, of course, you know, then those records increasingly are available through various websites and archives and family search and so forth. And My Heritage is a great collection. And so you, you really can make huge progress online. Once you, you know, find that one little nugget, then you can trace them back, you know, like, like crazy. Right. Now, one of the most relied upon record sets that we typically work with are census records. So tell us about the census in Scandinavia. Is it consistent, uh, the type of records and when they were taken amongst the three countries? Give us a little background on census. The, the dates are, you know, of course, vary a little bit. But both Norway and Denmark have pretty good censuses that are the sort kind of that we would recognize. Um, listing family groups and ages, and those can be very useful, and they're largely available online. Family Search has some, uh, My Heritage has some, the Digital Archive in Norway has, a, I think, pretty much all of them, um, and they're increasingly searchable. So you really can trace your family back in the sense as much as you would in the United States. Sweden doesn't really have useful censuses, but what it does have are, yet again, church records. They have basically a household inventory, and these are also available to a lesser extent when the other two countries. But in Sweden, it's really important that in addition to, you know, vital records, really every year in these church books, they recorded everybody who was living in the parish. So once you track them down to the parish, you can just trace them back and know pretty much everything, you know, year after year after year backward in time until there are no more written records. So they're often referred to as household censuses, and they're really tremendous, particularly if you're good at reading old handwriting and, you know, squiggly microfilm. But they're largely available. They're they're not entirely searchable yet. Um, That is still sort of coming. But with some patience, you can make huge progress with those, uh, those records. Now, you mentioned family search and my heritage before. Are there some Swedish sites that we should have on our radar for records? Um, the, there is one called Archive Digital 
um, which is a rather expensive Swedish site, um, and uh, it's a subscription site, but it has everything, and they're scanned in color, so you know you can really differentiate, and they have the most searchability, let's put it that way, of any any other. Ancestry also has extremely good Swedish records because they bought a company that had a bunch of uh, Swedish records, so you can at least browse pretty thoroughly um, in Ancestry. So the days when I was doing a lot of my work on my Swedes and you know scrolling microfilm at the Family History Center, yeah, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> it's all online, one way or the other. You know, and sometimes paying for the online subscription actually ends up being more economical than what it would take to to get there in person and travel or hire somebody oh, locally. Absolutely, or, you know, and, so. and really, in a three months of archive digital, you could make enormous progress if you've done, you know, sort of the homework. I wouldn't advise it as the first step because you know you're just going to sort of slog around. But if you already know, you know, something about where they came from um, or have found them in the immigration records that Ancestry, for example, has, you know, set aside, okay, these three months I'm going to pay for Archive Digital and really dig into it, um, and you can make, you know, enormous progress. So in digging further into records, it sounds like the church records are just really, you know, the go-to source. What other kinds of records should we have our eyes peeled for? Well, yeah, the church records and and in the mostly other countries, the census records are really the key. And the churches also we don't talk much about vital records, but of mm-hmm. course they have all of those vital records. So I like to sort of play back and forth between the household or census, and then you go find their vital records, and then you go back to the census and go back and forth, and you can really make a lot of progress that way. If you get stumped. It varies by country, but there are a lot of other possibilities. There are military records. There are some kind of land and tax kind of records. Again, there are church records, but there are, as I mentioned, vaccination records of the smallpox vaccination. Um, and those listed vital information about the individual, not just that they got, you know, vaccinated. So there are a bunch of, you know, other sources that you can kind of try. And that going back and forth, while well, it's useful, and I think every genealogy, it's just super effective for uh, Scandinavian records because they are so complete and thorough. Um, and so, if you are able to, once you once you get started in one line, um, you can make really enormous progress. I, tr- you know, trace them back from every move in their parish, for example, in in Sweden. So I've, you know, my great grandfather before he came over, I sort of figured out, you know, okay, he went here and then he lived here and then. You know, sometimes it was less than a full year. He was, I don't know what was going on there, but you know, <laughs> uh, he, he would move around. And so I traced him because if I didn't keep tracing him, then I wouldn't know where he lived, you know, before and connecting with his larger family before he became a, I guess, wild and crazy bachelor. Right. Now talk just for a second about naming conventions, because we know, you know, in Sweden, it's just not so simple that everybody's going to have the same surname going back. Yeah. So talk about that. And and maybe um, does how does that look in Denmark and Norway as well? All three countries basically follow the same, just slight spelling variations. That up until the early 20th century, it, some cities in Denmark were a little earlier in changing. But the the historical was if your name was Eric and you had a son that you named Eric, the son would be named Eric Erikson. And then if he had a son. Um, Anders, he would be named Anders Erickson, but that's because the father's name was Eric, not because the last name continued. It's adding Eric and son, literally what it means, versus saying that he just handed down that same full surname. Yep. It wasn't. It was really about whose child are you? Whose son? Right. Whose daughter? You, and then if, if Anders had a daughter, she would be, you know, um, Britta Anders' daughter. Yes. Um, and at some points, the the girls tended to take be, wind up as son um, the same way later on. Now the good news is, of course, you know the father's first name, even though the surname changes. And the, in all three countries, the mother kept her maiden name. Mm. So when you find Britta Anders' daughter married to Magnus Svensson. It's not a mistake. You know, they didn't, she, they didn't take the husband's name. 
and it, it will let you find Rita then in a previous record. And they almost always, particularly in Sweden, include uh, the person's age or most even better, their birth date. And it almost becomes like a social security number. Right. So you can tell if you have Britta Andrews' daughter and she was born on this specific date, when you find another Britta Andrews' daughter in the same place, born on that date, you're pretty sure you have the right one. It's important because you have so many similarly named people. Right. Which yeah. is why my last name is Frixell. Because my great-great-uncle, when he went into the Swedish army, um, his last name was Magnuson. And there were so many Magnusons that if you just said, okay, Magnuson, step forward, half the platoon would have stepped forward. <laughs> so they took army names, and he became Frixell. And when they came to America, his brother, my ancestor, um, took Frixell rather than uh, keeping Magnuson, and we've been spelling it ever since. Interesting. So give us a sense, two things historically. One, about what time frame would we expect the naming conventions to change? And second, in terms of time frame, is how far back would the average genealogist expect to be able to go in Scandinavian records? Well, since most of the people in America who have Scandinavian ancestors, the, those came over in the 19th century. And so your ancestors almost certainly would have that patronymic naming system when they left. And so, you know, Eric Erickson may have become Eric Erickson in America, or they may have adopted a, another name. Um, they may have kept that army name. They may have, in Norway, they had farm names. Mm -hmm. But in, in general, um, th the entire period that you're going to be researching in Scandinavia is going to have that patronymic um, naming system. And then how um, far it, back do you feel like most genealogists you know, can kind of realistically expect I to go? I think you should, with, uh, with a little luck, um, because the good thing is they didn't have a lot of wars there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like Germany where, you know, armies marched through and burned record repositories. So most of the records have survived. So, you know, with a little luck, you can certainly get it well into the 1600s. Um, and it's possible that you can get, you know, into the maybe even somebody in the 1500s. And not just an isolated family. I mean, you may be able to take large chunks of your family tree um, back well into the, you know, into the 1600s with a fair amount of detail, which is it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's kind of exciting. So, okay, so people are on a roll. They're getting through the church records. They're starting to build out their tree. And I love that in Chapter 16 – you deal with the reality, which is, it's called, what do you do when you get stuck? Or what to do when you get stuck? Because <laughs> everybody yeah. eventually gets stuck. Uh, give us a, an example of a common area where a genealogist might get stuck in Scandinavian research, and maybe one of your favorite strategies for unsticking them. Well, you know, it sort of relates to that question of the, the names. Because with so many common shared names, it's pretty easy to, you start tracing excitedly a person who turns out to be the wrong person. Um, because your Andrews Johnson may not actually be the Andrews Johnson that you're related to. Right. Um, and so, you know, a few generations later, and then suddenly it's not making any sense anymore. You know, always going back and double-checking. Um, go back, you know, take another look at the records, challenge your assumptions. Um, one of my uh, biggest mysteries was what happened in trying to find uh, one of my ancestors. turned out that once she got to America, she'd lost her husband and married a Belgian. And my relatives who remember this time in America say, that never happened. You, the Swedes would never have blended with the Belgians, you know. <laughs> well, apparently this one did. And then going back and just looking at the records um, again, my great-grandfather, Oscar Lundin, I was driving me crazy trying to find his passenger record because I had him on that side, I had him on this side. I just could not find wh exactly when he came um, or the passenger record until one day I happened to look at the passenger record of the woman that became his wife um, who traveled you know, with a couple of her sisters because her mom was already here. And next to her on the passenger list is 
what turns out to be Oscar Lundin. Oh, it, now, yeah. he wasn't listed as Oscar Lundin because, remember, they still had that changing you know, name business. Mm-hmm. So he was listed with his father's name and son. So right. when I had asked my, my aunt one time, you know, well, I'm having trouble finding about the Lundins. She says, well, oh, they were all Ingelsons when they came over. So (laughs) (laughs) that makes a difference. (laughs) Yeah. So here he is as Oscar Ingelson next to his future wife. And we love the story because I think I always think he I don't think he knew where he was going in America. And so he's on this ship with this, you know, pretty gal who's going to Moline, Illinois. And I'm thinking he says, you know, yeah, sure. You betcha. I think Moline sounds pretty good to me. Let's go to Moline. (laughs) (laughs) And the rest is history. (laughs) So it sounds like uh a. we have a couple of really good strategies in there, which is one to challenge your assumptions. Mm-hmm. Two, you mentioned looking really closely at all the details. I like to think of that as kind of the unique fingerprint of our ancestor. It's right. the people, the places, the names, the days, all the pieces have to fit. We can't just say, oh, got the name, let's keep going. And um, again, any of you keep in mind that those names may very well be different. Exactly. You know, so check all different kinds of names. And, you know, try to match them up, you know, with the dates and assume that, you know, that not all members of your family may even have the same last name once they, you know, arrive um, in America. For whatever reason, um, I still don't know where the name Lundin even came from, um, but, uh, you know, if I hadn't known that he was an Oscar Ingelson back in Sweden, I never would have found him. Um, right. So and that challenge brings- the, the names. And like you were saying, look closely at the clusters. And in a sense, when you can't find that person, you looked at the people who would have been around them, like a wife, and say, who's on the ship with them? Who's right. in the cluster? And I like and the last one you said, which is never say never. A Swede could marry yep. a Belgian. I mean, who knows, right? Yeah, so, exactly. It, never say never. It seemed impossible, but all of the na- first names of the children and all of their ages matched exactly. It's not something. In the sense... So there she there she was. Yeah. Um, and from that, then I was able to trace her backwards, um, you know, to the old country. Well, this book, I think, is definitely going to help all the people listening with Scandinavian ancestors to get back to the old country and to make really significant progress in their research. Um, I love the history portions that you have. But I love the details about the records. Again, the name of the book is... The Family Tree Scandinavian Genealogy Guide, How to Trace Your Ancestors in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And you've been listening to David Frixell. And David, I so appreciate you coming on the show and really getting us off to a really strong start in our Scandinavian research. It's always fun to talk to you, and I'm sure we'll be talking again on the Family Tree Magazine podcast. Well, thanks so much. If you'd like to get a copy of David's book, head to the show notes for this episode. Not only will you find our link that will take you to get your copy and order it online, which of course we always appreciate when you use our links because that helps support this free podcast, but you'll also find detailed notes about everything that we've been talking about so that you can refer back and really get going with your research. Okay, have you visited backblaze.com slash Lisa yet? If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household, losing all that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7 automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. 
Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. Profile America, Monday, January 13th. Today is the anniversary of the first radio broadcast to the public. It took place 110 years ago in New York City, engineered by Lee DeForest, a radio pioneer and inventor of the electron tube. The 1910 broadcast wasn't made from a purpose-built radio studio, but from the Metropolitan Opera House. DeForest broadcasts the voices of Enrico Caruso and other opera singers. A small but impressed audience throughout the city gathered around special receivers to listen with headphones. Today, 95% of American households have at least one radio. 110 years after DeForest's lonely effort, some 5,400 radio stations employ about 92,000 people. You can find more facts about America's people, places, and economy from the American Community Survey at census.gov. Thanks for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 237. Of course, you'll find the show notes for this podcast episode over at our website. Just go to genealogygems.com and under podcast, you'll go to the Genealogy Gems podcast and you can click on the link for 237. You'll also find it in the app as well. And also under podcast in that menu, you'll see that we have a previous show called Family History Genealogy Made Easy. That one is still archived and still available. So if you haven't taken a listen, check it out. And I'm happy to let you know that the Family Tree Magazine podcast is back on the air. And I am still hosting after all these years. Gosh, it's been over 10 years now. The Family Tree Magazine podcast took a hiatus for a couple of months as uh, Family Tree Magazine was purchased by Yankee Publishing. It's now back up and running, I'm happy to say. So if you uh, don't still have that in your podcast app, go in and search for Family Tree Magazine. And of course, you can visit familytreemagazine.com slash podcasts. I'm also happy to tell you that there's a couple of important conferences coming up in 2020. First up is Roots Tech. And that's February 26th through the 29th of 2020. It's going to be held in Salt Lake City. I'll be there. I'll be doing four different presentations. I've got three presentations of my own. And I'm also participating in a genealogy podcasters panel. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And of course, we will be up front and center at the exhibit hall right up front in our same location, the Genealogy Gems booth. So come on and say hi. I love visiting with you when I'm not speaking. I'm there in the booth. I'm happy to sign books, visit. And I hope you'll stop by because the theme for the Roots Tech Conference this year is about your story. And I would love to capture one of your stories at the Genealogy Gems podcast booth. Our plan is to have a microphone set up and two chairs and you and I can sit down for a few minutes and capture something that's on your mind. And and you may hear that audio right here on the Genealogy Gems podcast. So uh, head to genealogygems.com slash Roots Tech, and you will get all the details on everything that we're doing at Roots Tech. And the other big event that's happening in 2020 is the next My Heritage Live Conference. This is going to be their third annual, and it's going to be held October 25th and 26th of 2020 in Tel Aviv, Israel. And I'm very happy to let you know, I'll be there. I'll be speaking at My Heritage Live in Tel Aviv. If you've never been, and I have never been to Israel, this is a wonderful opportunity to not only see some amazing historic locations, but be part of an incredibly exciting genealogy event. So check it out, My Heritage Live, and I will have a link in the show notes, or just go to Google and Google My Heritage Live 2020. Until next month, I'll see you over at Instagram under Genealogy Gems Podcast, uh, on our Genealogy Gems Facebook page, and you can follow me on Pinterest as well. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.